Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, um, International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society um, patient groups and caregivers and uh, medical world who's watching us. My name is Daria Muir. I am the Vice President of International Autoimmune Encephalitis Society. And today we uh, have invited uh, Professor Joseph Dalmau, who um, does the needle off of introduction uh, as he's the, the name associated with autoimmune encephalitis in um, all the world and um, who has di discovered in 2007 the first uh, antibody, anti uh, MDA, um, and basically put autoimmune encephalitis on the, on the table in neuroimmunology who discovered 11 more uh, antibodies since then and who um, had a major impact on um, uh, diagnosis and care and uh, management of uh, patients worldwide um, dealing with autoimmune encephalitis. He's, um, work has defined and transformed um, the field of autoimmune neurology. And in 2023, he um, got the award of uh, scientific breakthrough from uh, American National um, uh, Neurology for his, his latest achievement. He is head of um, um, pathogenesis and autoimmune um, neuronal diseases in Barcelona as hospital clinic and EDBAPS. And um, he's here today to uh, help us answer the many questions of the still very gray area of seronegative or better to say um, antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. So dear Professor Dalmau, you have the mic. Well, thank you very much, Dario, for this presentation, this introduction. And okay, let's see if I did this well. Just one sec. Let's share the screen. Can you see the first slide? Can you confirm that you see yes. the first slide? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. Well, th thank you uh, for um, inviting me to give this talk about seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. Um, and the, the term is, uh, the term usually uh, seronegative means uh, absence of antibodies um, in serum and in CSF. Uh, this uh, sort of questionable, uh, some people can understand only serum, but uh, the focus is in having uh, no antibodies in serum or CSF, no uh, neuronal antibodies in serum and CSF. And it's a talk that it can be controversial because the topic is very controversial in terms of how you define this, how well the patients have been studied before considering that the patient has an antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. And uh, I can already tell you a little bit that uh, this is much, much less frequent of what people believe or what the diagnosis, uh, or this diagnosis is made. Uh, so to understand that, uh, I think it's very important to understand from where we are coming, that from the autoimmune encephalitis, from the positive autoimmune encephalitis, and then understand the, the problems that sometimes are in the diagnosis of these diseases, the approach that currently is taken, and just only by the end, we were going to uh, reach the antibody negative. We're not going to understand the antibody negative if the antibody positive uh, uh, diagnoses are, are not uh, clear. And why all of this has created so much impact. So there are now two or three groups of disorders associated with antibodies against uh, cells of the central nervous system. Uh, these are what uh, most of them in this part here are the paraneoplastic syndromes, but not all of them are paraneoplastic. What, what is common here is that 
the T cells rather than the antibodies. The patients have antibodies, but there are more biomarkers and the T cells are the ones that are causing neuronal damage, which is usually quite serious and frequently irreversible. And there are many diseases here. These were studied, studied in time, uh, preceded most of them, the what's called nowadays the autoimmune encephalitis. And many of them, as I mentioned, are associated with cancer. There is another group here, which is the one that you may be more interested, in, which are the ones that are called autoimmune encephalitis. And these are actually, some of them can also associate with cancers and in some way they are not so different in terms of cancer association as these ones. Although the type of cancer or tumors uh, may be distributed differently and they can occur um, without tumor also. And there are some of them that occur basically very rarely with tumors or almost never with tumors. And in here, there are uh, about like 10, at least 10 intracellular antigens. And this is approximate. In here, there are at least 15, 16. And there is a group of disorders that I'm not going to talk today. I'm going to focus on these ones in that the target uh, antigens are on the, on the glial cells, not on neurons, but on astrocytes or oligodendroglia. So all of these are rare diseases. So what it means rare disease? The definition of rare disease uh, is based basically depending on the country or even the continent sometimes. More or less is the same when you do the numbers, more or less the same. So a rare disease is a disease that strikes fewer than 65 per 100,000 people according to the World Health Organization. Uh, in Europe, is defined one over uh, strikes one uh, in 2,000 individuals, which the numbers more or less are similar. And here is 1,500, here is 2,000. And in the US, is defined globally like uh, any disease that has two, less than 200,000 patients in the population of the US is considered rare disease. So. If the autoimmune encephalitis are rare diseases, so why they are so splashy in terms of interest uh, of people? Well, in some way, the interest comes from, from the fact that in here this is a cartoon that I borrowed from the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance. It at least uh, an, a very large number of, of symptoms, and even, even this is a short list because only uh, affects the brain here, but they also uh, encephalitis that associate with myelitis. And so, and, and there are other symptoms that are not here. So associated with many symptoms, um, some of them are overlapping with other inflammatory mechanisms uh, or the inflammatory diseases of the brain, like infectious encephalitis and even other. And this other is important because nowadays the thinking is basically that if you don't have an infection disease of the brain or an infectious encephalitis, you basically have autoimmune encephalitis. This is the way of thinking uh, that is quite common and that's not true. I mean, there are many other inflammatory disorders that are not infectious or autoimmune. Um, and things have led to a situation of obsession for antibody testing, which many times is not comprehensive or sometimes not even uh, very specific, but led to a very persistent uh, idea that if, if, if a patient has any of these symptoms and for whatever reason, somebody asks for antibodies and there is any antibody that's found positive, automatically the patient is diagnosed with autoimmune encephalitis. Sometimes overriding the antibody overrides any common sense and there are many misdiagnoses based on that. And the, the, the reason is that is that, you know, everything has to be extremely perfect and well done, the clinical diagnosis and then antibody test and, and then put all together and then digest these and make a very clear differential diagnosis uh, before uh, one accepts that this is autoimmune encephalitis. I want to show you an example that this was published a few years ago by us, for example. 
And this case and other cases of children that have autism, for example, autistic, typical autism, and somebody had the idea to test for antibodies and uh, an antibody, a false positive was found and this young kid that uh, was treated for more than two years with very aggressive immune therapy that is totally unneeded uh, and, uh, and, and, and cases similar. This is a different case, but it shows uh, a big mistake here. This uh, was a 10 year old girl that came from other country um, for 60, uh, to visit us for 16 month history of symptoms that were attributed to anti nnd receptor encephalitis by, by a very um, famous center. But they didn't, they didn't spend too much time seeing the patient. The patient uh, had tiredness and irritability, episodes of falling asleep, uh, sudden loss of muscle tone, uh, and mood dependent lingual movements with the tongue, movements with the tongue, and a, a serum testing uh, showed NMD receptor antibodies and was started with treatments, right? Uh, what is the issue here? Well, first of all, a serum testing on for this disease, you have to test the CSF. And, and then uh, perhaps they didn't listen very much, didn't spend too much time with the patient. Uh, that as time goes by, this happens more and more. People rely more in tests than in seeing the patient. But the first thing that the mother of the children show us in the iPhone or whatever cell phone she had is enormous quantity of pictures with, a, with, with this child falling asleep everywhere. So here um, was when she came to see us. And what you see here right away is that this is not an NMD receptor encephalitis. There is no NMD receptor encephalitis that in inactive disease shows this type of behavior following the commands and doing all these things. And this is the same child after all these treatments. And you can see here that has these sudden movements with a with the head and with the tongue. Okay, but she she is enjoying what she is doing. She's doing, and now when she when she laughs uh, in some way, sometimes also uh, misses uh, you know, has uh, uh, affected the muscle tone. So it turned out that this child in polysomnography and multiple had had uh, alterations in the sleep of what's called narcolepsy cataplexy, and everything uh, everything the clinical picture. The, uh, the genetic testing, and the search for levels of uh, protein that is a marker of this, that's called hypocretin, everything was affected. So this, uh, this is a child that let us, uh, my colleagues as Grouse and I to think, well, we have to try to help uh, clinically speaking to make the diagnosis of these patients. So this came uh, with a group of colleagues. Uh, and, uh, we, we published this paper in 2016 about the clinical diagnostic approach. And the idea here, you, you don't have to memorize this or you don't even have to look this, but um, the idea here is, okay, imagine that we as a doctors, we are in an island, that there are no laboratories. And if you, we want to, to, to check for antibodies, we have to wait a few weeks. So how we approach these patients, just only clinically, uh, you know, uh, visiting the patients. Uh, the antibodies are done in parallel, but we put them aside or we wait and we approach the clinical features. And then it came out with this algorithm uh, with, uh, you know, following the algorithm, you, you know, in some way you follow and, and you can make a diagnosis clinically on, in, on some steps, not all of them, some steps. And the key points here is the beginning, because this is the, uh, what we call, this is the point of entry. So what we decide is, okay, we're going to make some sort of minimal requirements to, to decide if this patient is worth to follow then with all these studies uh, for autoimmune encephalitis or 
if from the beginning we see that this is probably not autoimmune encephalitis. So, so this is the point of entry that I'll show you this later uh, in the in the next uh, in a couple of slides. And then this continues is is a is a long algorithm. So this is one of them, a check mark. I'm going to discuss later. And this is again it continues from before. And this is you have done all this, and then you at the end you are left with some possibilities or the patients have already been diagnosed or some patients have not been diagnosed, everything has been negative. Then you reach this point at the end of this algorithm, which is a very important critical point because this is where you're going to find out the seronegative or the antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis, okay? So, but it's very important this, um, we are dealing here not with one disease, with many diseases that are autoimmune encephalitis. There are, as I mentioned before, 16, 17, even more. With many diseases, so it's not so simple as to make a criteria of one single encephalitis, no? This is not like a Pulporum 4 or MOGA, no? This is, you, you're approaching the patient clinically and at the same time waiting for uh, the antibody testing. So let's go to these two points, the point of entry and the last point. This is the point of entry, okay? So the point of entry, we focus very much in the patients that had uh, the most difficult type of a scenario to make the diagnosis, to sort out um, uh, what patients we should include here or not. For example, somebody can argue, well, uh, let's say um, encephalitis without without psychiatric symptoms or without altered mental status or short-term memory uh, loss, which is, is a requirement. Any encephalitis doesn't have here, we're going to miss. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, but uh, there are not so many encephalitis without alteration of the mental functions or memory or psychiatric symptoms. There are not so many. And some of them are easy to just uh, make the diagnosis very quickly. You know, you can have obsoclonus, myoclonus, and, and, and the patient can be confused. You know, it's, it's, it's also uh, some sort of encephalitis, but this is not included here. Or patients that have only a focal encephalitis in the cerebellum only along, for example, cerebellar dysfunction or brainstem. But this is a sort of another group or another category. These are the most difficult, the ones that I'm showing here um, in some way to, to um, I, I believe, to diagnose sometimes or to short uh, between them. And then uh, in addition to this, the patient uh, must have at least one, at least one. We did this very flexible, not better restricted because we wanted to include as many patients as possible before going through this algorithm. At least one of these uh, new focal uh, CNS central nervous system findings, like let's say, for example, um, difficulty moving or difficulty feeling uh, one extremity or face, uh, seizures not explained, uh, new seizures, new onset seizures not explained, the patient didn't have seizures before, or history of epilepsy. The spinal fluid is critical, uh, inflammatory alterations in the spinal fluid, MRI alterations, one of these, at least one. And then what is frequently missed even by physicians, the exclusion of alternative causes. It is critical. This is a, this is a, a requirement as important as any of the others, okay? So let's see the third requirement because remember that I mentioned before that many times patients with an inflammatory disorder of the brain, if they don't have an infectious disease or infectious encephalitis, it basically is considered as an autoimmune encephalitis. Well, that's not true. There is a long list of processes that are infectious or not infectious that they can, they can associate with inflammation and it's not an infectious encephalitis, uh, many of them are not, and it's not uh, one of these autoimmune encephalitis. So um, the differential diagnosis is quite uh, big to keep in mind. So just keep in mind before saying that the patient is seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, before saying that 
you have to go through a very careful differential diagnosis and you have to carefully look for all the antibodies or at least uh, do a comprehensive study of antibodies, not five or six, which are the ones that one laboratory may be testing. Um, this does not categorize as seronegative. So let's talk about the antibodies. Well, a comprehensive, a very comprehensive antibody testing is not easier. It's not easy in, in, in any clinical laboratory. And, and because there are um, continuously new type of antibodies described, some of them are very useful. Others are totally useless. You can put them all in the same category. And some of them, they don't have even clinical value, right? So one way to approach this always, always taking in consideration the clinical context. Think about the video that I show you. Patient is first, clinical history is first, neurological exam is first. Then they come the antibodies or the MRIs or whatever. This is first. Uh, so in here, you have to put this in conflicts and then there are several ways to look for the antibodies. It depends on the type of antibodies. Uh, this would be, in our opinion, the best way with a tissue-based assay, but this is, there are tissue-based assays that are commercially available, but they are not good. They are not good. Uh, I can be generalized about, I can generalize about this because we are completing a study now, uh, testing uh, commercial uh, tissue assays. They, they are not very good, but if you, if you have a good tissue assay, it's extremely helpful. And then depending on how they look, you can look for a cell-based assay to confirm what you suspect here or immunoblot if the, if the antigen you suspect that is intercellular. This is a good tissue assay, okay? So this is a section of uh, brain of rat um, and that uh, you see here the area of the hippocampus and this is the other hippocampus. And what happens is this has been a stain with or has been incubated. So in some way you take a section of rat brain or mouse brain um, is better than using this tissue that the human brain, because in the human brain, you're going to put a whole human brain in a slide or some of these type of antibodies is very good to see the pattern looking at the whole entire brain. And you can put uh, the, the, the a section of rat brain in a single slide. Uh, so what you see here is the hippocampus only. And this is one antibody that reacts against cell surface proteins, as you can see here. These are cultures of neurons incubated with this antibody. Look at these like neurons here. The antibodies react very nicely against something that is on the cell surface, okay? This is an amplification of here. Okay, and what you see here is the body of the neurons and all of these staining all this dot like is like um, the staining of the antibodies with a protein express on the on the surface like here of the neurons. These are very difficult, very different type of assays. This is tissue and this is like isolated neurons. Okay. So it turns out that this is an MDA receptor antibody, but you would find a more or less a similar type of uh, type of a staining, not exactly the same pattern with other antibodies against cell surface proteins. And this is an antibody against an intercellular protein. And what you see here is in live neurons, you don't see any reactivity because the antibodies cannot penetrate live neurons. And in here, um, the antigens are intracellular, so you don't see anything because the antibodies in a live neuron cannot penetrate inside the neuron. And in here, you can see it because this is tissue that has been, this is tissue that is dead tissue, no, has been permeabilized. And you can see the antibodies, but the patterns are very different, okay? Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit now about uh, the, the, the diagnostic approach and then uh, how important it is to look for the antibodies um, uh, very, very, very carefully. And, and you, you can do, you can put this a little bit aside, but when the patient comes to you, you want to go fast. You more or less, you get the first impression. You don't have the antibodies until a few days or perhaps tomorrow if you do them themselves. Uh, but anyway, 
And then you can already make a, a, a plan of treatment even without knowing the antibodies, even without having them. That, that was the idea of this algorithm. So what are the most common diagnostic errors nowadays that in our experience happen and the people send us emails and et cetera? So th the most common is the misuse of the, of the algorithm that I told you. I mean, the algorithm has to be followed but continuously, all of it, okay? You cannot stop at the first... Uh, checkpoint at the entry, you say, oh, this, because it has these minimal characteristics, the patient has possible autoimmune encephalopathy. This is not the case. You have to follow all the algorithm. If not, um, it just doesn't make uh, any, uh, any sense uh, to, to have it. So a lot of mistakes come from this. Uh, so people look at this here, and they don't, they don't even follow this. They stay here and they say the patient has these and the patient has possible autoimmune encephalitis. No, no, no. The patient has the minimal criteria for considering that maybe an autoimmune encephalitis. So this is one uh, important uh, mistake. Uh, the other one is the problems in determination of neural antibodies. I'm not going to enter here because this is like two talks of two hours, basically each one the inappropriate differential diagnosis. So all these disorders to exclude are not excluded or are just look very superficially. And the literature doesn't help very much, particularly the literature in some fields like psychosis or epilepsy or movement disorders. There's a lot of literature on autoimmune psychosis. Like if this was a disease, it's like if I say autoimmune pain, there is no entity of autoimmune pain that you can have an autoimmune disorder that associates with pain, or you can have an autoimmune encephalitis that associates with psychosis. Um, so, uh, but there is the literature has been also uh, uh, sometimes not very clear about that. So uh, all of these are um, words that I'm saying, and this could be, well, Dr. Dalmau is very opinionated about that, but in some way, um, uh, what I'm saying is reflecting the experience of uh, we and others have published. This is a, an article in that we were not involved. We actually wrote some uh, editorial comment uh, of these. The journal asked us to write an editorial comment, but this is the data of the article, this is 393 patients, um, uh, adults, with uh, considered to have autoimmune encephalitis and seen at six academic centers, considered academic centers of excellence of autoimmune on autoimmune encephalitis. And what you can see here is that this was a retrospective study, not prospective, so that the doctors look at the, the cases or the patients that have diagnosed in a, during several years on autoimmune encephalitis, or then, then they looked also um, in the records and, and they find out that uh, of these uh, 393, basically uh, uh, one fourth of the cases were misdiagnosed. They were not even autoimmune encephalitis. This is in centers of excellence over seven years. There are several things surprising here. This is the big number of, of diagnostic um, uh, errors. Uh, and this is like only 393 over seven years in six academic centers, which the number is seems to me quite small. Now, um, these are parts that we analyze when the editors ask us to, to give our opinion. Um, and also the authors already pointed uh, some of these. Uh, look, 72% of these misdiagnoses would have been avoided if the doctors would have followed the first two requirements for autoimmune encephalitis. So of this slide of the first checkpoint, there were three. The third one was excluding other, disor other disorders. If they only had followed the two first ones, 72% uh, of the misdiagnosis would have been avoided, okay? 95% uh, of misdiagnosis would have been avoided if they had followed all three. So they would not even have been considered uh, autoimmune encephalitis. 
then 50% of misdiagnoses uh, were caused by serum testing alone. So, uh, so that means that basically one of two, 50%, of course, uh, um, uh, they, they, they were caused by the misinterpretation of the serum testing. Now, if you had used CSF, uh, basically only 8% of misdiagnosis would have been made. Uh, so it gives you the extraordinary value of the CSF and autoimmune encephalitis. And when we interpreted this, the way that we do things here in our institution, basically, the, basically by CSF, there were almost no misdiagnosis. Would have been, I think that was like one. So uh, emphasizing very much the importance of examining not only serum, but also CSF. And then what is important is that 25% of these patients have a psychiatric alteration, psychiatric disorder. Why happens this? Well, psychiatric diseases, many psychiatric diseases, frankly, they don't have a, a treatment. They, have, they, they don't have a curative treatment. You have treatment for the disease. You can compensate, you, you know, but uh, they don't have a, a, a final uh, curative treatment. And some of them are, are very serious and devastating, like let's say schizophrenia. Uh, and many, uh, many, many patients, or sometimes uh, uh, family of patients, they are desperate to find a cause. That, that's very logical to find a cause, an alternative, uh, an alternative possible diagnosis. So they look uh, sometimes uh, very much for other alternative disor um, uh, disorders. And if you do this indiscriminate testing uh, to, to all these patients, you find sometimes like a positive uh, test uh, that um, in, in, in the experience shows that many of them are, are really not relevant or false positives. And then, and then there is a problem. So uh, what about uh, the errors now on antibody testing? Well, this is a highly specific and sensitive approach. You know, this in commercial labs is very difficult. It's, uh, um, you know, it's, 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 it's sometimes consuming, not very much, but it's uh, like three tests. So uh, commercial labs, they want one test. It's easier and it can be faster, even better. So if you have a patient with this, with the tissue assay, with light mutants, and with a cell-based assay, the way that is shown here, basically 100% uh, specificity and the sensitivity is extremely high that this is going to be in this particular case. Again, in this case, is an MDR receptor encephalitis. I can tell you that, but you can have the same approach for other antibodies. Now, if you use a commercial approach, uh, like a single cell based assay, which is not like this, the commercially available are a sort of not a similar approach, but it's a similar approach, but not identical. This is even better. Uh, so if you do this, this is what happens, okay? Using the same test, if you test, that these are studies that have done in the literature, if you test patients with a schizophrenia, let's say, you find some authors, you find zero patients have antibodies, let's say against an MDR receptor, against an MDR receptor. If you use the same exact test, the same one, same one, same patients with a schizophrenia and are the, and the studies read or interpreted by others, you find 21% not only a schizophrenia, but also healthy individuals that have antibodies. So how do you explain this? Well, we explain several ways. First, the, the test, when you look in serum, is not very good. Test is good, but with serum, is, is, it gives you some uh, sometimes difficulties in interpretation. And then, of course, there is the experience of who is this. But this explains very much uh, the, the confusion that there is in the literature and I'm not going to go through this, but these are uh, some of the papers published and you can find all this range of positivity. What's our experience? Our experience is that patients with a schizophrenia, they don't have the antibodies of patients with an MDR receptor on cephalitis disorder. This is uh, our experience. They don't have the same antibodies. If they have antibodies, um, uh, it's, it's, it's different. 
So, well, this, uh, for example, is, uh, this is uh, uh, psychiatric literature, the number of papers describing with several psychiatric disorders, uh, the presence of antibodies, uh, um, uh, sometimes with controls missing, et cetera. Uh, for the book that we wrote uh, recently on autoimmune encephalitis, uh, uh, we look carefully all, all uh, study by study. We put the numbers all together of all the patients. We consider the controls. And so that when you look at the numbers, actually, this is what's surprising. 1% of all these patients with an MDA receptor uh, with, with psychiatric diseases, 1% were considered to have an MDA receptor antibodies. Were considered, okay? Now, when you look at the healthy persons, 1% were considered to have an MDA receptor antibody. So all this literature is highly questionable uh, in terms of the value of these antibodies in primary psychiatric disorders. I'm not saying psychosis. Primary psychiatric disorders. So, and similar problems has happened uh, over time with epilepsy. If you look at the literature a few years ago, the number of papers of autoimmune epilepsy were huge. The number of papers are extraordinary. Um, uh, more recently, this has disappeared because actually it was autoimmune seizures, not autoimmune epilepsy, actually. And what it means is, it means that in encephalitis, you can have psychosis, movement disorders, and you can have seizures. But when the encephalitis is treated, the seizures go away many times, not always, but many times. And what defines a patient to have epilepsy is that epilepsy is an enduring disease with chronic seizures. So these patients don't, don't many of them don't qualify for autoimmune epilepsy. They have autoimmune seizures. The same as you have an infection of the brain, you have seizures, the infection is treated and cured, seizures are gone. Not always, but most of the times. And the same happens with other symptoms. And uh, well, then uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, the autoimmune or the seronegative autoimmune encephalitis or the autoimmune, I, I prefer to talk about or, 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 or use the term Antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a new problem, a new problem emerged because nowadays um, the extraordinary number of patients that, or, or doctors that they send emails and sometimes asking for opinions or even papers published about seronegative antibody negative or seronegative antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis is too, too high. And we reviewed carefully this recently, actually, um, less than one year ago uh, for, in this manuscript, uh, um, uh, talking about many of the problems that I mentioned to you before, and also about the concept of uh, antibody-negative autoimmune encephalitis. Just remember the algorithm that I showed you before. At the beginning of the talk, there was a point of entry and there was a point in that you basically have gone through all the possibilities and the patients at the end, uh, you, you don't know what the patients have. Um, you, you, the number of patients have been already, uh, many of them diagnosed, but then there is a, a remnant of patients that after going through all of these, you don't know what they have. They have still an inflammatory disease of the brain, but you don't know if this is autoimmune or not. So this is why um, at the end, uh, the, 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 the last point of the algorithm uh, is, is talks about probable seronegative or probable antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. And in here also we made a requirement to consider, well, the patient may have probably seronegative autoimmune encephalitis if after all this work by the physicians, all this work, clinical work, to go into the differential diagnosis, you have excluded everything else, then if the patient then has this criteria, right, the, the rapid, similar to the initial one, rapid progression of memory problems, altered mental status, psychiatric symptoms, exclusion of other diseases that are already in the algorithm that uh, are typical, maybe negative, but they are typical uh, autoimmune, autoimmune encephalitis, like the encephalitis, and, and then 
um, you have to demonstrate that there is inflammation of the brain, but here you have to be very sure that there is inflammation of the brain before characterize that the patient has a probable uh, seronegative or antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. And then on top, we have all the exclusion of alternative causes. So, um, so which are the misdiagnoses of, uh, of seronegative autoimmune encephalitis? When you do all of these and you reach at the end, and you may categorize that these patients have a seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, if we analyze the most frequent errors, which are, which are the most frequent errors? Well, first of all, is again, to not have used well the whole entire algorithm or the criteria that I just show you here. Uh, here there are four points of the criteria. Remember this, because then I'm going to get back to this. Okay, so this is one one cause. The other one is that, of course, there are autoimmune encephalitis that um, occur or they evolve um, uh, more slowly than, than than three months. So some encephalitis uh, sometimes evolve slowly. LGI1 could be could evolve slowly or Casper 2 or Iron 5 can evolve for years. But you, you have to keep this in mind here. This is more for the a, a rapidly progressive autoimmune encephalitis. The other ones are less frequent. All the presentations like a chronic form is much less frequent, except for Iron 5, which is characteristic uh, uh, with a uh, with a long progression, but the the clinical picture is is different from this one with iron five, and uh, predominate some some uh, sleep uh, alterations, and also they can present with uh, sometimes looks a neurodegenerative disease and so on. So it's it has been well described. So the physician should know this and only not rely only on the um, on. on on an algorithm only uh, without having any experience of putting everything together. So uh, then one problem is that, uh, well, um, you have followed these and you have tests for antibodies, but you have not tested for all the antibodies. So for example, until recently and still nowadays in many uh, laboratories, they don't have GABA-A receptor uh, antibodies tested or iron 5 uh, until recently, um, basically all the iron 5 came to us, and now, now uh, there are other uh, centers that they, they do that. Uh, the MOG, now the MOG, uh, everyone basically is doing it because it's a very hot uh, type of group of diseases, uh, the MOG, the MOG uh, syndromes. Uh, but then there are other entities that are mixed sometimes with the, with this group of encephalitis, but there are different type of disorders. Some of them, you don't know very much the cause of them, like uh, NORSE, uh, new ones, refractory status epileptics. This should be a diagnosis by exclusion of, of any other um, uh, autoimmune encephalitis. It's not a specific disorder. It's, is, is probably a mix-up of disorder. The thing that they have in common is that after sometimes an infection, patients present uh, with a uh, uh, febrile, uh, febrile um, episode, the patients present then with uh, seizures, uh, refractory seizures. The pandas and pans is, is um, there are um, there are criteria of, of these, and, and many people uh, don't use this criteria. But when when you compare carefully the, the, the type of autoimmune encephalitis that we're talking today and the, the pandas and pans, um, the, the, the clinical features are uh, quite different, actually. Uh, the Hashimoto encephalitis is another entity that some people even question the existence of this Hashimoto encephalitis. I think that probably exists, but extremely rare and does not associate with any specific antibodies. Uh, there are TPO antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, but they are not uh, specific of this entity. And so this is a very big problem. And, and then problems in antibody testing this is more or less what I said to you before and, and inappropriate exclusion of a disorder. So these are, um, uh, in, in my opinion, the main problems. Um, 
And, and these are examples, as I showed you before, uh, when for this article that we published in Lancet Neurology, we reviewed the literature existing uh, on seronegative autoimmune encephalitis until this time, and we found 20 case reports. And basically, uh, of these 20 case reports, 15 didn't fulfill the criteria of antibody-negative autoimmune encephalitis, 15. Only five fulfilled the criteria for antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. So imagine these are reports that have been published, but the actual the criteria, um, they, they are not followed. I mean, so these patients uh, of these 15, uh, we, you don't know what they had. Uh, you don't know that they had autoimmune encephalitis or not. We don't, you, you don't know it. And in here is not case reports, but in here is a series of patients, right? Uh, and in here you have um, 15 cases, 15 case series. And of these 15 case series, all of them have problems. But paper by paper, we went through it. And we reviewed all the criteria, how the, how, how the patients were allocated in this category. All of them have problems except two that in some way follow the criteria well. And in one, the, the, in one, they didn't find actually antibody negative seronegative, uh, or seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. And in the other, they found 44%. So how do you explain that from zero to 44? Well, in here, the antibody um, screening was much, was more comprehensive than in here. So that's, that's the main explanation that we found. So I'm going to, uh, these are the, the, the suggestions to, to try to refine the diagnosis of anti autoimmune encephalitis and antibody negative or seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. So use the diagnostic algorithm. It's, 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 it's really good, actually. We recently tested in a prospective study of 800 children. And it's actually quite good. Um, it, it was, it was very fine when, when, when you uh, follow carefully. Considering also the, the limitations, and there are some entities that you, you don't put in analysis in this type of algorithm. Uh, remember that some of them have a chronic presentation. You should, should keep this in mind. And the antibody testing, how do you do it? Well, the antibody testing um, uh, include always CSF for, for these entities, only CSF and serum. You, can, you cannot cut corners. Cannot cut you, you just you, you have to, if it's an autoimmune encephalitis you have to look at the CSF um, and the, some exceptions are uh, some of the antibodies against the glial uh, cells like uh, acoporin four or MOC but uh, the, the CSF is a must and um, um, yeah suspect a false diagnosis if the CSF is negative and the serum is positive. Um, this, this was the case in a false diagnosis of the girl that I presented in the first video. Um, and, and of course, also uh, just try to be a doctor and this goes for the doctors, right? It just, the, a, a test should not override the clinical uh, assessment, right? So if it doesn't fit, then you should probably examine more, uh, uh, double check this carefully more or or if you are not an specialist in the areas and uh, double check with a specialist or even consider uh, an alternative uh, laboratory to do, to do the antibody testing. So how do you treat these patients, the antibody negative, uh, but probable autoimmune encephalitis? Well, you are not sure. Many times you're not sure that this could be an antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis. For these ones, you are sure because the clinical criteria by itself are very strong. You don't need the antibodies here. There are some with antibodies, you don't need them, some of them, okay? And, and then this is the classical approach to the, to the treatment. Uh, so are the, what's called the first line of treatment, steroids, IVHU plasma change, second line, rituximab. These are the, the best and most um, uh, studied and, and, and the ones that were for sure in, in, in many patients, right? Um, uh, first line, second line has been perpetuated in the literature, but in some way, rituximab should be probably a first line uh, of treatment because very useful. Cyclophosphamide is very effective also and is, is much less toxic of what people believe because many times you just only have to give 
just a couple, two or three pulses of cyclophosphamide. These are very tricky because you don't know very much about if they are if they work or not. Many people think that um, they treat patients with rituximab and after three weeks, the patient does not improve and they consider that this is treatment failure. And that's not the case, is that some of these diseases, there is a lack of, of response and many, uh, well, many, there are not so many, so many cases published with bortezomib, botocilizumab, but of the many that I reviewed that, that have been published, uh, I would argue that what they see is the effect of rituximab, actually, the, the late effects of this treatment. In fact, when many people call me or ask my opinion, the patient has been, uh, is not responding, is severely affected, and you seem that everything has been treated, and you start using uh, bortezomib or tocilizumab, they don't work. In, in my opinion, most of them, when they are, they, they don't. They um, so uh, so you are going to need. This doesn't mean that they don't work for all of them, but you, the, for here you are going to need a clinical trial, which is what is this. You are going to need a clinical trial to sort out what is the best, and then uh, treatment symptomatic. The patient has seizures or other alterations of movement, etc. This is the treatment of the of the well-defined autoimmune encephalitis. Now, what about the the seronegative, well, you have a big question mark. Uh, most of them is probable. You don't know exactly if this is really a seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. So after trying these, or oh, these, I would argue that perhaps cyclophosphamide you would not need it to, to, to have an idea. If the immune therapy works, then it's very questionable to, to go to experimental. You don't have a clear diagnosis or definitely to these treatments. And you don't know you have to maintain the treatment of these patients. You don't even know they're going to relapse. So there are many uncertainties about the treatment, and this is why it's so important to do a good, uh, a good diagnosis. So what are the future directions? Well, educate physicians and, and patients about seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. Um, in, in, my, in my opinion, and we are finishing, a re, uh, we were just finishing a prospective study of 750 something patients, not 800, 750. And, um, and, uh, and it's, it's very uncommon, seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, but it's really very uncommon when, when, when you follow all this comprehensive uh, approach. So we have to promote the studies of prospective cohorts of patients. Uh, you know, multi-institutional, uh, it's very difficult to do this in a single institution, and, and identify genuine groups of seronegative autoimmune encephalitis and look for biomarkers and, and uh, treatment approaches. And basically that's all for, for today. This is the group of, uh, of uh, colleagues that work with me um, in Barcelona and in several places in Europe and that help to put together over the years, some of the experience that I show you to you today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, it it is. We have a lot of questions, and I've been trying to to. Um, make um, a short list of them. Um, it's it's literally tens of questions to question Q and A's and on on the email. Um, one very technical question involving tissue assay. If you work with with rat brain, is the risk of you have the risk of false negative due to species uh, specificity. And if your uh, test is positive, um, does it, um, is it really seronegative or zero unknown? No, with, uh, I mean, with all the tissue assays, you need a complementary uh, confirmatory test. You I remember we, we are talking only in doing one test, in, but doing at least two, a, a tissue assay and a confirmatory with a cell-based assay. And if then if uh, you, for example, find a, 
the tissue assay that is positive, but all the cell-based assays are negative, then you may think that this could be uh, a new antibody or perhaps an antibody not included in the cell-based assays, and then you can proceed with additional studies with cultures of neurons and so on. But this is only always done in a, in a context of a research laboratory. Um, then in terms of the uh, rat brain or, 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 or rodent brain, I mean, uh, the, the proteins in the human, uh, in the, the human proteins and the human, uh, and sorry, and the rodent proteins are, many of them almost identical, very, very close, similarly in sequence. So <clears throat> in my opinion, the advantages of, um, you, you have the risk of, missing uh, antibodies that are not described yet and that may be only expressed in, in, in human brain. There is, there is this risk, of, there is a theoretical risk, and it can happen, for example, with some, mock anti, some, uh, some types of mock antibodies, you don't see it with, with, with blood tissue. And um, um, other epitopes you can see. However, um, the advantages with the tissue um, assay uh, is um, with with the rodent uh, brain is that is is the quality of the tissue the quality of the tissue is extraordinary because in some way what you do is that you um, you, you 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 kill them you kill the rat or the mouse and, and and immediately you have very fresh tissue and you can fix the tissue you do procedures to keep the or preserve the quality of the protein there. In here, for example, you have a ton, uh, multiple antibodies uh, that you can see them with red brain. Um, so this uh, overrides very much the studies with human brain. In human brain, you would uh, you, you would have a lot of problems to, to identify this because, um, because let's say in human brain, a little piece, I don't know if you can see where is my pointer here, like a little tiny yeah. piece here, a little tiny piece here, right? Um, would occupy the fullest light, a little tiny piece here. Now the fullest light, you can put two, two, uh, two whole brains like this in a slide of tissue, you can put two whole brains. And the pattern of it is very important. So if you use human brain, you would find this. Now you, you find this here, from here, from here, from here, you cannot make the difference, even sometimes from the control. If the control is a little bit dirty, even um, in this case, no, but if you see it, you cannot differentiate. So uh, the tissue assay has um, a lot of considerations. Um, I think that all of these can be seen with plant brain or rodent brain and uh, has many advantages in terms of the quality preservation of the, of the proteins. If the human brain is uh, fixed, then uh, it's, it's, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't preserve this quality. Another question, this, this time from the more very practical approach um, regarding CSF testing. Mm -hmm. So some patients get a form of treatment, steroids or IDIG or combination or rituximab before having the, the CSF tested. Hmm. How does that impact any findings? It, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. If you have antibodies in the CSF, uh, let's say if you have a patient with AMP receptor or GABA-B or GABA-A or LGI-1, uh, if you have antibodies in the CSF and you treat the patients and, oh my God, we cannot do now the spinal tap, whatever, uh, we are going to do the spinal tap in four weeks, in one month, but the, perhaps the antibodies are gone. They are not gone. Uh, they are still detectable quite well. I mean, perhaps the titer has decreased a little bit, but they are there. Uh, we... Um, we have a lot of experience comparing serum and CSF because since uh, I would say more than 30 years ago, um, when I was starting uh, studying with uh, the other category of diseases, paraneoplastic syndromes, and then they came these ones, we always tested both samples. So, uh, so there, are, there, there, there have been some 
very opinionated sometimes, uh, groups saying only the serum uh, should be tested, but they didn't test the CSF. I mean, so you have to, if you, if you say that, you have to have a lot of experience with CSF. And CSF is uh, um, a very good uh, reagent for this. Look, um, I, I have... Uh, um, uh, I have uh, CSF uh, and, and, and samples of patients when I was um, uh, many years ago, of more than 25 years ago, they are still positive. I mean, they are, they are frozen and sometimes you, uh, you can uh, throw them and, 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 and test them in tissue, they, they are still positive. So they are, they are very stable. Now, this is different from the question that you are asking me, but um, uh, the, the antibodies the, decrease, but slowly um, uh, after treatment, but you have uh, certainly weeks of margin to if you send serum and then you want to make sure uh, send the CSF, you, you, can, you can do that. I, I would not recommend to do it. I would recommend from the start to use both samples. And if you have to select one, and you suspect an autoimmune encephalitis that is not MOC or is not um, aquaporin-4, um, um, uh, if you have to do to check uh, or to, to, to use one sample um, uh, in our hands, I uh, would select CSF, including LGI-1, which in our hands, the way that we do it, um, and um, you, you find it uh, similarly in serum and CSF. A very maybe anecdotal question, but it's it's still a thing that we we meet a lot of times. What? How do you how, how do you store the CSF? The CSF can is very. That, can can it be stored at room temperature before being tested or? The, the CSF actually is easier to store than the serum because the serum can get more contaminated. Uh, this very just minimal. With minimal care, uh, it's not contaminated. Doesn't uh, doesn't uh, uh, sort of uh, get spoiled. But the CSF is much easier to to keep. You you can keep the CSF for months at four degrees in a in a regular uh, refrigerator. Would say that you have at home. You can keep it there. How are kept kept in the lab? The samples are kept frozen at minus, uh, in our case, minus 80 degrees, no? But you can keep, the CSF is very stable. So for this, for example, if you have to send CSF from here to Australia or the other way around, you don't even need the, the, the ice, for example, you can send it, um, you can send it at room temperature. For for other types of tests, yes, but for this type of antibodies, you don't you don't it's quite stable. And um, what do you do, or what should should um, not a, a super experienced doctor who knows autoimmune encephalitis in their dream? Uh, what should they do if they have a borderline positive CSF? Like a borderline positive uh, pleocytosis, or they get a commercial test and the antibodies say that they are detectable, but not in high well, time. It's is important to keep in mind that the CSF, by I mean, the CS, CSF is a test that is done in many different situations, not only in autoimmune encephalitis. You examine CSF in other types of autoimmune diseases, in in diseases that are not autoimmune and diseases that are infectious. So the CSF is a common test that the neurologists do in many different diseases, right? Um, so uh, um, I, I, I missed the question. Um, the, the, what I, do you I, do if, if it's borderline? Yes, yes, yes. So um, the, the one thing, the most difficult um, to assess when it's borderline is the, is the serum. Uh, the CSF is usually a more clear-cut picture, uh, at least for us. If uh, the, the result is borderline and some way I, you will have to repeat the, the study or uh, the other possibility is to use more than one test, right? I mean, so um, what, we, what we do and 
and some other places do also, is um, we do two tests, right? You, this one with tissue and this one with a cell-based assay. So um, it, it's, it's very difficult that in, we see as if you at the end after with these two tests, you end still with doubt. Um, with, with the two tests, basically, um, you, you can make a decision most of the times, so or almost always, uh, at least in our, in our experience. Now, with, with the settlement, if you use only one test, then that's very, very tricky. That's very, it's, it's a very, it's an important source of errors. Remember, it's like 50%. This is not, in my opinion, like 50% of misdiagnosis um, uh, were overinterpretation or misinterpretation of serum. But with the CSF, more clear cut. Um, are there any emerging biomarkers apart from um, antibodies that can help or are, um, is the research exploring that area and diagnosing autoimmune encephalitis? Well, there are the clinical biomarkers, the, cl the clinical, uh, in some way, not biomarkers, but the clinical markers that to follow patients. Uh, uh, just a few hours ago, uh, we, we published a paper in Lancet Neurology in that the study of a sleep in patients with anti lg one encephalitis is, 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 is very, gives a lot of information that you miss during the day when the patient comes to you in the in a half an hour visit, uh, being generous in many places, you don't even have this time to see a patient. Um, but the video polysomnograph, uh, the, the sleep studies um, reveal a lot of problems that are still the patients have, like for example, uh, facial brachial dystonic seizures that people believe that they are only at the beginning. Well, that, that's, uh, yes, they are at the beginning, but there are also some remnants later on, sometimes even months, um, when you do a sleep study, it's the same as some seizures, um, uh, sleep uh, dysfunction, in LGI-1, in other diseases, not, okay. So th there are these uh, knowledge, in, in clinical knowledge, that we still don't know very much. I mean, the people you know, of these diseases, people that have been, uh, I include myself, uh, that we, we have been studying these diseases, has had a process at the beginning, uh, we we concentrated very much in the presentation of the disease, in the bulk of the disease, in the acute phase. But then, in the post-acute phase, we don't know very much. So, it would be good to have these markers or biomarkers that could be study of sleep or study of EEG or, or some special um, studies. Not not the classical MRI, which could be helpful, but also MRI with a more advanced uh, type of sequences and imaging, right? To, to put an example, then in terms of more biomarkers in the serum and the spinal fluid, well, they are complementary biomarkers. Depends of then the clinical situation of the clinic or the, or the disease. For example, uh, we found that was useful in patients with uh, psychosis with at the beginning patients with pure psychosis that they, they, can, they can follow the track of being a primary psychiatric disorder when you follow these patients, or it can be the presentation of anti-NMDR receptor encephalitis. We found that in this clinical situation, the neurofilaments, the termination of neurofilaments was useful, was complementary, was useful. Now, neurofilaments in other autoimmune encephalitis and other settings, probably not, because they are going to be elevated anyway. Um, most of the time. Uh, so this is one we recently examined biomarkers when exploring uh, what's called nanostring, exploring uh, genetic activation um, of, of several, uh, the activation of several genes um, uh, uh, in the context of viral encephalitis versus autoimmune encephalitis. Um, and, and this this could be a good biomarker for when you have to differentiate between a patient that has herpes encephalitis and a few weeks later still have symptoms. Is this autoimmune or still herpes encephalitis? So there is a biomarker that was recently published that uh, that's uh, it's, it's called nanostring. It's very sensitive. Um, there are tons of studies about cytokines uh, in, 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 in the profile of cytokines, but I found them so far not very useful because they are always altered 
in any type of inflammatory disorder or most inflammatory disorders of the brain, whatever cause, uh, if it's autoimmune or not. Um, but but the, the the things go in that in that direction, right? Um, uh, immunophenotyping the cells, so find the profile of the of the cells that are of the, the cells that that in some way uh, form part of what you call the pleocytosis. Now it is distribution B cells, T cells, some types of cells, uh, subcategorizing these cells. But uh, some of these can be useful in the future. So find uh, is still in active research and it may turn out that is not useful it may turn out that it doesn't separate very much one disease from the other or doesn't tell you very much what's going to happen to the patient later on because you know you have an inflammation of the brain you may have uh, uh, these uh, um, uh, alterations uh, no matter what the cause is a question that we often get this time from the doctors. How do I treat and for how long? And when do I know that it's time to move to the next treatment line? Yeah, well, the 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 time to move to the next human line is that I think these diseases have to be treated uh, aggressively um, in terms of uh, from the beginning. Uh, most of them, uh, of course, it's 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 good to know the type of disease, and it's good to know um, the profile. Uh, so uh, let's say let's put it in another way: the spectrum of the disease over time. You know, for example, the NMV receptor encephalitis. Let's say an example: the patients are very sick, many times a long time in the hospital. Uh, the patient you would consider this a terrible disease that they are going to do worse than the patients with anti-LGA1 encephalitis that sometimes, or many times, seem to respond faster. Okay. But this is the acute phase. Now, if you look, compare the patients after three years or after two years, you realize that probably the MD receptor encephalitis patients at the end, they do better than the LG1 encephalitis patients in terms of recovery, full recovery, cognitive recovery, and uh, going back to work and so on. Uh, it has not been done, this comparison, but this is an impression that so you have to know the disease to figure it out a little bit, the prognosis of the disease and how the patient is going to do after responding to the treatment. Um, so how the treatment should start? I, I think that, for example, um, uh, rituximab is, is, is a drug that, and this is our fault in our initial studies, we categorize patients with first line, second line, and so on. But And still, um, still uh, people are doing, and, and this is uh, some sort of, uh, some sort of um, uh, way to communicate, okay, let's just start with first line and you uh, plasma change, IVIG, steroids, then move to the second line. So, But this, these lines have become blurry as more as you know with the diseases. For example, in, in rituximab, we use it basically almost as a first line of treatment combination with the other ones, right? Um, so uh, we sort of... Uh, Aggressive. There is a, a more aggressive of what the begin that at the beginning, and there is also this um, uh, impression that we had that some meta analysis suggests that if you use rituximab, in addition of being relatively quite well tolerated, the, probably the relapses are less frequent, and and so on. So. Um, so uh, for how long is, is, a, is a good question for the NMD receptor encephalitis, I wouldn't say for how long. You just basically follow the patient, see what happens, um, see how the patient gets better. Um, for how long you have to treat the patient with myasthenia gravis, so until the patient gets better, um, and then even, uh, you know, uh, you can make a plan to the patient to go home, continue with the immunotherapy for a little bit longer or for a more chronic way. Uh, in here, the same with, uh, for example, anti nmd receptor encephalitis, which is probably one of the most frequent with LGI1. So you have, in here, we don't know enough like to make general rules. You have to follow the patient one by one. Uh, what we do is that as soon as the patient is able to go home and uh, most of the acute symptoms have passed and the patient remains with cognitive dysfunction and with uh, some psychiatric alterations, but they can function relatively 
um, uh, well uh, at home, even if they cannot go to work, but you see that they are trending to get better. We stop the treatment there. We, we don't use any more immune therapy. We watch them very carefully. And uh, this is what we do with NMDA receptor encephalitis. With the LGI1 encephalitis, I think that the paper just recently just published uh, yes, yesterday, midnight, um, uh, I think will change things, actually, because um, I think that it turns out that when the patients go home um, and they come back to see you and they say, no, I'm doing much better, but I cannot go back to work because I still have problems in in cognition, and then you say, okay, and you have seizures? No. Do you have facial brachial dystonic seizures? No. How do you sleep? Okay. But then you put the patient overnight with a video polysomnogram, and you see that there is an iceberg that the patient tells you that they have minimal symptoms, and then you see that actually the, the, the sleep uh, study reveals that there is much more of what you can, you, can, you can see or the patient is telling you, the family tells you. So uh, all of these, uh, we are in a, in a learning process here. Um, and I kind of give you exact, uh, exact uh, general guidance about for how long. And in um, antibody okay. negative? Well, the antibody negative is even, even worse, right? What I would do with these patients is after going through all what I said today uh, to make sure that that is really an antibody negative uh, uh, patient, I would, you know, I would uh, give uh, the patient uh, uh, if, uh, like first line immune therapy and or perhaps even rituximab if I was very convinced. And depending on what the patient does, then, then, um, uh, then proceed. So this is a study that has not been published that I was telling before even. I was mistaken with the number. So this is seven, seven I'm sorry, you don't see it. Sorry, 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 I don't see that. Uh, yeah. So this, this is prospective. This is a study done for uh, uh, now for several years um, on children, it's 129. Uh, patients with initial suspicion of autoimmune encephalitis. Now, what is special in this paper? Well, that every single patient has been followed very, very closely over all these years. And, uh, and this study started before the algorithm was published. So we know everything of these patients. So we know exactly where we, this is done several years later, where the diagnosis was missed, where not missed. So, of these 729, for example, 297 that initially suspected the doctors and ourselves, the doctors, this multicenter, autoimmune encephalitis, they end having non-inflammatory diseases, several subcategories. 111 had uh, an infection, um, had most of them viral encephalitis. Then uh, these 229 had autoimmune encephalitis. And of all of these, there were 92, that's a 13% only, that had inflammatory diseases that we didn't know the cause at the end. And when we dissect these, actually, the number of probable autoimmune encephalitis was even smaller. So when you do a very comprehensive study, the number of auto, seronegative autoimmune encephalitis is not so big. So what, what we do with these patients uh, you are not really sure. There is no biomarker that tells you this is autoimmune encephalitis, seronegative. There is none. I mean, you don't have to. Um, so you are obligated to exclude all these possibilities. And, and then after this, then uh, suggest uh, 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 a treatment. So I would do an experimental treatment, like a, a trial of treatment for, for example, three months and see how the patient does. Patient gets better and gets cured fine. The patient, the patient gets cured. Um, oh, oh, sorry, is, is getting better. Would continually to be longer than three months. Um, um, why three months and not four months? Uh, that's something for the future. But right? that that's when uh, you know the combination of everything enters and the experience also uh, enters. You have then to follow these patients closely and think about that. 
um, uh, that some of these patients improve spontaneously. You know, you give minimal uh, treatment and they get slowly better. So you have to put also this in context. So the, the treatment and the evaluation of the seronegative autoimmune encephalitis is probably the most tricky one that exists nowadays in, in, this, in this context. How do doctors that don't have access to, uh, like they, they only have access to, to commercial kits, you said get in contact with the with the research or send 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 samples to a, a yes. research well, lab. Well, oh. look, I mean, this is something that people have to be very clear about. This um, it depends on the age of the patient. You have a patient that is uh, in the pediatric age. If the patient basically, we have done now two studies on this. This one has not been published. The other has been published with more than 2,500 children. So in, in children, you don't need all these panels of antibodies that the commercial tests do. You basically don't need them. You know, in children, somebody can argue, okay, there is one patient that I saw, another one is published in the literature, et cetera. But this is not how medicine works, you know? I mean, uh, do, do, do you have to see the whole entire picture here. In children, if you test for MOC and you test for NMDA receptor antibodies, basically, and these antibodies are negative, the possibility that there is another antibody in children uh, with autoimmune encephalitis is quite, quite low, okay? Uh, very difficult to find a child with LGI-1 or with Casper-2. There are cases reported, yes, of course, but um, um, in this case, a series of 2,500 patients, like basically uh, only 10% of them um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the positive have other antibodies. 2,500 suspected autoimmune encephalitis in children, uh, there were like basically only 2% that have uh, antibodies at the end that were not NMDA or MOC. Uh, um, and, and there were about, the, the, there were 10% of all the positive. So it depends on the age of the, uh, of the, age of the patient, um, you may find an antibody or not which is important. So all these panels, extensive panels that you have, all these paraneoplastic antibodies applied equally in children and adults, I think that this is a source of errors, frankly, and I think is an expense that is not needed. So in these particular cases, I would carefully evaluate the child with, with uh, clinically and then that's for the most probable antibodies, one of these two. If these two are negative, yeah, okay, you can go for the other ones, but the possibility is remote. In adults, it's different. There are, many, there are many other antibodies to keep in mind. So when you test this, what um, in, 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 in any hospital, or small hospital, hospital, they don't have these facilities, what you should do when, first of all, make sure that you test CSF, okay? Make sure that you test serum and CSF, you find an anti, you are not sure, but serum has been tested, CSF has not, make sure that the CSF is sent. This is one thing. Then uh, make sure that the laboratory test for an antibody that is reasonable, that you expect uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the clinical picture of the patient. And if you still suspect that the, there is an antibody and, and, and the, the, the laboratory tells you not, then probably call the laboratory or, or, or look for a, an alternative, more, uh, more research-oriented laboratory. I, I cannot tell you more uh, about, about this particular situation. Um, remember, the algorithm was originated like this. Think, think about it that we don't have any lab and how we approach these patients. Of course, it's much wonderful if you approach these and you have the lab, you know, by the door, but um, that's uh, sort of the, the real thing is you, you, you does really the hospital, need to make some Does phone the calls. hospital you work in take, uh, accept requests from other countries? Yeah, yes, yes. So they can, they can... Yeah, this has, all, this has always been done like that, so... Um, they, they they are done this uh, following a combination of uh, of tests that uh, uh, include the, including the commercial tests, but including also some in-house tests. And, 
the, the most common one of the most common uh, requests nowadays is the, precisely this you know it's just to uh, physicians that are or family members that are uh, although basically we communicate with physicians more family members sometimes are very is, is very is a, is a very difficult situation sometimes because you don't have so much the clinical details and the families even they don't have them so the best thing to do is is communicate also in, engage also the, the physician right so then uh, uh, then uh, do a comprehensive analysis um, so actually, we we do this. Yes, we have like a board every week in that clinicians. Everyone is involved and discuss every case and, and so on. And people that from other yes from other countries they send uh, they can send the samples here to 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 the labs and they can even present the patients via via Zoom or via video and they can even do that. So, <clears throat> but I I think that this is. We have been doing this for many years, and 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 we we it's a little bit routine for us, but I think that is also um, done in 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 some other centers also. To be honest with you, yeah. When I was when I got sick, there was no in ten years ago there was not that possibility. No, of course. Well, ten years ago, there were many things that uh, we didn't know. Uh, I mean, if you put uh, push this back to fifteen years ago, there were basically no or seventeen years. There were no antibodies. That there was no need for labs because I mean, at least for do for for this because they were not even uh, many of them. They were not even known. Yeah, this is a this is one thing uh, that the the field has evolved very fast. And, uh, and 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 the, the caveats and and pitfalls and and tricks and the best way to do things have been so, so fast that that um, that sometimes has to be put in order, right? And, and, and to reassess everything. So that it's uh, this is where we are. The question keep the questions keep keep coming in. But out of uh, respect for for your time, I think I'm going to stop it now. Unless you want to take one one more. Well, you, I mean, yes, no, no problem. I can continue for ten minutes more. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm currently in Spain, so it's seven thirty in Spain, seven twenty nine in Spain. So I, I just my day is uh, is in some way uh, finished. I don't have to go to see patients or to do anything else. So it's the end of the day, so we can you can ask questions. Thank you very much. Somebody is asking if um, seronegative autoimmune encephalitis is more critical and dangerous than compared with other type of antibody positive. Um, I, I I I don't know about this. My impression is um, basically um, uh, not necessarily in some way can be even uh, so in this particular study here of this <coughs> that I showed you before. Um, let me see if I can have the pointer here. Of these 92 patients that basically you end the having tests for everything, everything is negative. But the patient has an inflammatory disorder of the of the brain. And with uh, manifesting, these 92 patients are more described here, manifesting like a diffusion encephalitis or cerebellar brainstem or basal ganglia, etc. Most of these patients improve. When I say most, probably 80% of them we are analyzing this data now, but I was, uh, you know, stricken by this, uh, improve with uh, with uh, with the treatment, and some of them were not treated, and they also improved. So the impression is that uh, that they don't necessarily um, mean that these patients have to do worse. I mean, they they may improve with immune therapy or with mild even anti-inflammatories. And some of them not. For example, in here there are three that they have. Uh, what we believe is that this thin disease not reported until now. Uh, these three, we have two more, but there is no part of this study. Five, five patients 
they didn't improve. They did actually it was uh, the, the 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 outcome was very bad. They didn't improve at all. But m most of them, yes. What is the role of EEG in well, diagnosis? EEG is important to uh, well, it's, it's important because uh, in most of these autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, uh, shows an alteration of the brain function that many times the MRI can be normal or minimal uh, alterations uh, that you don't know if these are related even with the disease or they are depends on the age of the patient or, and the EEG is clearly altered. In, uh, in addition, they are, they are also for the studies of sleep, the, the EEG is very, very important and there are some EEG, even some patterns of the EEG that are suggestive, highly suggestive of, of, of a disease. This is not very common, but this happened with one pattern in an MDA receptor encephalitis. And uh, it serves to rule out other diseases, and it seems also to, to, to follow the patient um, um, uh, along the time. And of course, uh, you know, to monitor not only the brain function in general, but also either patient has seizures or not, that uh, you, the patient can have seizures non, not manifesting with motor alterations or just only uh, uh, electric, uh, uh, electrographic activity with the EEG. You know, the patient can sometimes, uh, you know, uh, stare to uh, in the space. And, and if you are a neurologist, you know, the patient may be seizing, maybe having a seizure, but Sometimes it's not so obvious, and the EEG just picks this up very, very, very clear. How long should the EEG be? That that's another that, thing. The that EEG is... should be uh, followed during uh, the acute disease, and then uh, depending on the disease, during follow up, if you suspect that the patient is going to have seizures or have seizures are still, you you have to follow with the EEG. Is 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 it depends. Is again patient by patient. Um, but in terms of the length of the the exactly the length of the like the short EEG that is ten minutes or fifteen minutes, or well, the in, well in the, it depends on the level of suspicion. I mean the you know if uh, ten or fifteen minutes is a very short EEG, right? For the for example for this study we just published now is that. Um, you, um, you 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 probably will need a very long EEG even for a number of hours to pick up some of these alterations. And, and the EEG is integrated on the what's called video polysomnogram, the sleep study. So when you do, for example, a sleep study in patients, you register everything. You register the you know the breathing, you register the, the brain function. And there is EEG, you register the muscle function. So everything is registered while the patient sleeps for eight hours. So you have a very long time in that the patient is sleeping more comfortably or less because with the cables, it's not sometimes so comfortable, but very, very, um, very innocuous and not invasive. And, and that you, you have a lot of information. Uh, this needs to be done with any disease. No, no. For example, we already did the study with uh, NMD receptor encephalitis in the phase of recovery. And in many of these patients, after the acute phase, the, the EEG in terms of revealing new things, um, it, it's not uh, many times doesn't reveal new things. Now for the LG, I want to just the opposite. It's very, it, it, it turns out to be very useful. So this is on demand. This is, uh, so in uh, some way, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to sound here paternalistic, but like in anything in medicine, you know, somebody who knows about the disease, I mean, you, you, cannot, you cannot handle this disease only testing an antibody and then looking at Google what the antibody means. This, this I, I know that this doesn't happen, but uh, most of the time, but in some, in some, in some times, yes, you know, I mean, uh, or, or the overinterpretation of these or the, you know somebody, you need somebody who knows a little bit about this disease and integrate everything. But this is not discovering anything. This happens with any type of in the field of medicine. Well, I could keep on for four hours with you. It's, it's, it's an immense pleasure to, to, and the honor to have, to, to have this, this opportunity to, to learn from you and to, um, uh, 
ask you a question, but uh, I think we will we will close it now again out of respect for for your time. And I don't want to stop before thanking UCB Pharma who this year uh, kindly helped us to organize these events and uh, thanking everybody who uh, um, took their time to um, watch us today. And again, thank you again so very, very much for everything that you are doing in neuroimmunology and for everything that you shared with us today. And uh, I hope you have a, a great evening and looking forward to read the new paper that was published last night. Well, thank you very much uh, to, to you and, and to the people that have been in the audience. I have no idea how many people have been Hundreds. listening, but I hope that, uh, I mean, I hope that uh, what I, I, I said today um, help uh, in, in some way um, and to uh, to put a, a little bit of realistic uh, thought, uh, in my opinion, uh, to the concept of uh, uh, seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. And again, nothing is uh, completely sure at all. You have to keep an open mind. This is an evolving field. And, uh, but I mean, the impressions that I discussed today and sort of substantiated uh, by by the literature of experience of others and ourselves. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me.